So thank you, everybody. I'm very, very, very excited to present Dr. Kristen Miller and the students of the AARG group in the Space Studies program. Um, this is always my favorite topic <laughs> every time we host research for the public good. And I know that there are some students who are not able to join us today. So Dr. Miller will be sharing some recordings there. Um, but with that, I can go ahead and turn the floor over to you, Dr. Miller. Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Thank you to everyone who's here. We're so glad that you made time in your day to come and hear um, the presentation. We appreciate it. And um, we're really excited to talk to you about the um, APUS Analog Research Group. Uh, this is something we've been doing for about two years now. And you can see here our little um, pirate logo, which is a nod to our acronym, ARG. Um, so this is our space theme, Jolly Roger here. Um, but the purpose of the APUS Analog Research Group, our first purpose is, um, it's a student-focused research group. And so our first purpose is to prepare students to serve as crews on terrestrial, lunar, and Martian analog simulations. And I'll talk more about what those are in just a minute. Our second, um, our second uh, main purpose is to perform meaningful research, right, which will be relevant in long-term space exploration. So um, research projects that increase our knowledge of space exploration that make it a little bit more possible and that are interesting to NASA. And we also are looking at establishing partnerships um, within the analog and academic community, the space studies community um, that provide APUS students with opportunities to participate in analog missions. It also gives them um, ways to make connections and to um, have some pretty cool experiences and opportunities. Um, this is our website here at the bottom and I'll have a slide with lots of those at the end. So for those of you who are not familiar with the term, uh, what is an, an, a terrestrial analog? astronaut habitat. Well, a terrestrial analog is just an Earth-based structure that mimics the conditions that astronauts live in in a space environment. So whether that space environment is the ISS in lower Earth orbit, the International Space Station right in lower Earth orbit, or whether it's a future settlement on the surface of the Moon or Mars, um, the habitats are built and designed so that they are very similar to what life will be like in those settlements. So we, we can't um, we can't mimic the conditions, of course, of zero gravity or lower gravity, and we don't mimic the conditions of high radiation exposure, which is dangerous, but we can mimic many other aspects of the um, space environment, and especially the fact that, um, that these settlements will be isolated, they will be um, closed habitats of necessity because they've got to keep, you know, atmospheric pressure and oxygen and everything in the habitat so people can survive temperature regulation. Um, and, and we also hold to an astronaut schedule. So the students who are participating in these missions, they're known as analog astronauts. We have several of our analog astronauts as well as our planning staff with us today. And, um, and it's a chance to live and work like astronauts. Um, the reason that we do analog missions is because not all experiments are possible to do in space, right? It takes a lot of time, a lot of money, um, a lot of expensive equipment, and a lot of manpower to do all of these experiments in space. And it is just not practical to do all of the different research that needs to be done in order to figure out how human beings can successfully survive in space for long periods of time. If we try to do that all, for example, at the International Space Station, where they're doing tons of research and great work, but if they tried to do all of the experiments that are needed to make that happen, it would take years and, and billions and billions of dollars. Whereas if we do them in a ground-based analog, right, we can do it for a fraction of the cost. Um, we're talking, you know, thousands of dollars as opposed to billions of dollars. And, um, and we can do them in, in bulk. We can repeat the experiment. We can do it with a wider range of people, um, a wider range of, um, you know, materials, um, there's a there's a great quote that you want to try before you buy, and that really applies here, that allows us to try many different things to see what works, to see what will be safe, to see what will help before we actually get to the analog environment, um, to the actual space environment. Um, there are also 
Uh, we can also test some countermeasures in analogs. So the space environment is, of course, harsh. It's not conducive to human life. And we're trying to develop mitigations and countermeasures to make it possible for human beings to survive there. Um, if you're testing a new countermeasure, you'd really rather test it on Earth, where people are not going to die if it doesn't work, as opposed to space, where it would be really bad, right? So it's another reason to do things on Earth. Um, there are as I said, you can do it more quickly, less expensively, and we can also cover a much wider range of characteristics, right? So our crew complement can have a wider range of age, gender, ethnicity, et cetera. Um, you know, there are a very small number of people who have actually been to space. The number is somewhere in, you know, around maybe um, 40 or 50, if you include the people who have been there for less than three minutes, the ones who have just gone above the Carmen line and come down on the, uh, the space tourism flights. If you exclude those, the number drops significantly below that because um, there just aren't that many people who have been to space. Um, the ISS has increased that number, but, um, you know, compared to the variety of, of human beings, it is a small number. The number of people on Earth, that number is tiny. So um, in analogs, a lot more people, a wider a range of people and um, a, a greater number of people can have that ex experience. Um, analog research. So uh, we are a research group. Our main, uh, one of our main goals, as we said, is research, is to give students the opportunity to perform research. Uh, you know, in our online environment, it's so, um, it, it can be really challenging to provide those kinds of leadership, those kinds of research experiences um, where we're asynchronous and everything's virtual. Um, this gives students a chance to um, perform that kind of research. We're able to support some capstone research. We're able to support publications. Um, analog research, it's, it's multidisciplinary. Uh, and I just put a couple of different examples. I could have, you know, 20 more up on here because there's such a wide range of things that we look at and, and things that you're able to do and important research that, and interesting research that's able to be done. And I think my next slide shows you a couple, it gets a little more specific. Yeah, these are some, just some of the research projects that we've done with a couple of fun um, pictures from some of the, um, the research uh, some of the, the missions that our students have gone on. So in ARG, we support both student-led projects. We encourage student-led projects where each student develops their own research project. And you'll hear about some of those a little later in the presentation today. We also do group projects where um, they may come from the leadership or from, um, you know, a, a subgroup within our program that's developing a particular research project. We have um, an exciting one in the works for our next mission, actually. Um, and we also support collaborations. So we, um, when we go on the analogs, we have done research belonging to uh, other groups who have contacted us and wanted to work with us in order to get their research done. Uh, and those have been pretty exciting and a really cool opportunity for our students. And like I said, our research is multidisciplinary. And again, this is just a very condensed and non-comprehensive list of the different kinds of projects that we have actually done to date. So we've looked at, you know, EVA mobility, habitat design, plants, lots of plants. We've done a little bit with communications, search and rescue options. Uh, we're looking forward to doing some astronomy um, studies, a lot of human factors that works really well in the environment, um, stress mitigation, another one that works well, um, and many more. And these are just uh, some pictures on the left here, are some fun pictures from the, uh, these are all from the ILMA habitat actually, um, that shows some of the research that our students have been able to do. Um, so with that, I am gonna um, just talk just briefly about the organization within ARG, and then we'll get to the good part that I know you guys are waiting for. We'll get to uh, hear from some of our students, but um, the ARG organization, we are student managed and faculty advised. And what that means is that my job is a lot easier because these guys um, take control and they provide leadership and they do um, all of the real work here. The program structure um, covers mission planning, mission execution, post-mission um, debriefs and communications. Um, I just want to show you our, our, um, our current org chart, um, and you can see um, it, it's kind of a, a dual, um, dual chart here. We have the program manager side. Our program manager is one of our Space Studies graduate students. He just recently um, graduated, actually. Um, 
Scott Van Hoy couldn't be here today, unfortunately, but um, he has he actually developed the entire organization chart and did a fantastic job. You'll notice that the faculty position is much smaller because our part is is not as extensive. The students really are, um, you know, leading and, and providing the uh, leadership and the direction for the program. So um, as faculty, um, we um, handle the research coordination. We have academic subject matter experts who advise on topics and um, procedures. And then we have the research coordination team who play a really important role by tracking progress and working individually with each um, uh, with each researcher to make sure that they are mission ready. Uh, the program side is where it gets really interesting. We have the program manager who oversees everything and then each mission, and we have you know two missions outlined on this plan. Each mission has what we call a flight director. We'll hear from the flight directors later, but the flight director is essentially um, the essentially like a program manager for that mission. Uh, and they have a deputy flight director who is their direct assistant as well as operations specialist and a risk manager for each mission. And then on the other side, we have the crew commander uh, and the, with the mission specialist. And those positions, the crew commander and the mission specialist, those are the analog astronauts. Um, so that's kind of the way we organize each mission. And you'll see here it's, it's duplicated for each mission all under the leadership of the program manager. And then the last column here in the middle, um, the chief of staff, this is the chief of staff is the head of our um, <clears throat> our planning organization, uh, the safety officer, the recruitment coordinator, the com communications manager, and the training officer who provide um, you know, all of the support and training that's, that's more mission-centered, sorry, program-centered as opposed to mission-centered. So the flight director and the crew would be mission-centered, and then the chief of staff is going to be more program-centered. So this is kind of the way we organize things. Um, and I, I kind of run through that just because in a minute, right next, I'm going to pull up the slide and let you know who we're going to hear from, and you'll recognize some of these positions. Um, we're going to hear from the planning staff first. And then we're going to, uh, some members are playing staff first, and then we're going to, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our upcoming missions, and we'll hear from some of our analog astronauts. So for our planning staff, we have with us today, Tony DiBernardo, who is our communications manager, Laura Riske, who's on our um, communication team, um, Shay Rackley is one of our operations specialists, and James Sheffield, who is our safety manager. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to Tony. I'm gonna stop sharing um, for now and, uh, <clears throat> and turn it over. Guys, we're gonna go in that same order. So um, Tori, Tony, Laura, Shay, if Shay is here, I didn't see him come in yet, but hopefully, and, um, and then James. So Tony, I will let you take it away. Thanks, Dr. Miller. Uh, can you all hear me well? Some nods. Okay, great. Uh, first, thanks for thanks for having me, Dr. Miller. Thanks for um, allowing me to help represent this organization. It's an honor to be up here, and um, I'll make this quick because I'm actually excited to hear everyone talk about the research as well. The this position that I'm in is not as research based yet, um, but like Dr. Miller said, my name is Tony DiBernardo. I am the communications manager for AARG, uh, which basically means that I help to oversee all of our outward communications from the program. So helping the general public fully understand what we do, uh, to teach them about what we do, why it's so important, things like that. And I, I really like being part of this program um, because every every mission that we do, it feels it feels so real. And it is real. I mean, the real missions, the work we do is real. Um, but personally, on a personal note, when I used to watch, you know, these space movies when I was younger, like, you know, Apollo 13, all, all those ones, um, it wasn't really that the astronaut that I saw myself in. Um, it was all those, all those men and women portrayed in mission control. I kind of dreamt of being in their chair someday. And so while my current role of communications manager um, and that one that I aspire to work with is not in mission control, uh, whenever I do work with the team and coordinate social posts and send out daily mission reports and ensure that our research is effectively communicated to the general public, it kind of feels like I'm in one of those chairs, like I'll be at home typing up these reports with my you know, NASA jacket on and stuff like that. It feels super real. Um, but it's also really enriching for me because those of us with a more liberal arts background, you know, like 
communications, PR, social media, um, it can be really intimidating to, to find a place in, uh, you know, in the field, in the space industry. Um, it's difficult to find opportunities because it's so dominated by scientists, engineers, researchers, um, mathematicians, physicists, all these things, uh, which are obviously great. Uh, but this program is great because it gives every student, no matter what their background is, an opportunity to contribute to the success of the mission. So I'm a father of three. I have a two, I have a full-time job and a part-time job, and I never thought I'd be able to work on these skills, but being a student at APUS, I mean, we, we have a great time. I get to get this experience and um, I get this hands-on experience for uh, the exact role I want to work um, in, at NASA someday. Uh, I get to learn, you know, all the steps in executing a mission from start to finish. I don't know where else students are able to learn that uh, while doing a full-time job. Uh, I get to work with an incredible team. I, we get to, you know, have experience working under such strict guidelines, whether it's what we can publish to all the safety guidelines that they have to follow. Um, and, it, and it really feels like we're all kind of contributing to the success of a mission. Yes, I'm, I'm very busy. Uh, not, yeah, I, I have a one month old at, at home and we're having a great time actually with it, but that's the thing we we've been able to all work together and my team has been so amazing. So, um, I, I want to stop there. I want to let the others speak, but, uh, thank you for your time. It's been, it's been great being here too. Thank you so much, Tony. We're, we're really glad and lucky to have you. Um, Laura, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. So, um, Again, I, I am going to echo a lot of things that Tony just said, but I'm really excited to be here this morning. Um, I am relatively new to AARG and a little bit of background about me. Um, I actually live in Homer, Alaska, which is South Central Alaska, and I am attending APUS to work on an undergraduate certificate in space studies so that I can go on and get my master's. Um, and being in Alaska makes a career change like that a little bit difficult. And so finding a program like AARG has been huge for me as a way to get experience outside of what I'm learning in my classes. Um, that feels like real world experience, but I'm able to do that from home. Um, so I'm able to be a part of a team and work with a group towards research that, you know, is going to help future developments in space um, as, as we head to Mars and the moon. And I was able to participate in the most recent mission as part of the communications team with Tony. Um, I was helping create the social media posts for based off of our, our blog posts and the daily reports that the crew was sending in, um, which is, you know, a whole other experience aside from space things that I, it was a good learning experience. I haven't had to do that in a professional capacity yet, and I really enjoyed it. So it helped me discover something new that I liked. Um, and so, yeah, I'm excited to be a part of this and hopefully be a part of future missions. Um, I'll be working to support the next OMA mission. And um, I'm really excited about it. And this has just been a really wonderful opportunity for me to get that experience um, from where I'm living. And I've also found out about things like the La Space Mission Academy through people in this group, which is another great experience that I'm also doing right now, um, aside from working full time as well. So I, I feel you, Tony, on being busy. It's long days, but it's all good stuff. And I'm just super excited about the research um, and the work that we are doing along with everything else. So thank you for having me this morning. It was great to be here and I'm excited to hear everyone else talk. Thank you so much, Larry. The communications team did an outstanding job on our last mission. I'm excited to see the directions that they moved to. I mean, it looks like Shay wasn't able to make it today because of work. So James, I'm, we'll go ahead and, and go to you and I've got your slides. So I will pull that up now. Um, Go. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Miller. You guys hear me okay? Yeah, okay. So my name's James and I'm an undergrad at APUs and I was recently appointed to safety officer. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. 
uh, I get to bring in some of my experience as an NCO uh, from the Army and implement the safety and risk management that we use on a day-to-day -day basis and incorporate that into what we do. No, oh, sorry, with AARG. <clears throat> Uh, as soon as I uh, learned that APUs had a student-led program for analog missions, uh, I instantly reached out to get involved. I really didn't know much about uh, what it takes to conduct an analog mission or what all was involved in it. Uh, I did know it was something I wanted to do as I was uh, carrying on with my degree in space studies. So um, yeah, I, I jumped at the opportunity and I'm glad I did because I've, I've had the opportunity now to observe nearly every aspect of an analog mission from the planning phase through safety and risk management, uh, through the actual missions themselves and seeing uh, all the studies that everyone does uh, up into the actual debrief of missions once they've completed. So it's been great. It's been an excellent uh, learning experience for me. Uh, I'd say the best part of it though, is getting to work with uh, such amazing individuals, uh, influential. And you know these are people that they are not just participating in the analog community within the school, but uh, with the analog community around the, the the entire world, so they bring a wealth of experience that you know they get to shed and and, and divulge to us, and I, I just think it's great. I've learned so much since joining. Uh, if you see the slide there, that brings me to my next point. So I've had the opportunity, or I have the opportunity now, to work on my first mission with ARG, which is uh, a future mission coming up in, around January of 2024. And that is uh, dubbed ARG-1 Alpha. And ARG-1 Alpha is to the Aquarius Reef Base in the Florida Keys. And uh, it's gonna be a, a very exciting mission uh, underwater, right? It, so Aquarius Reef Base is the world's only underwater research facility and is trained and hosted over 58 astronauts from various organizations uh, around the world, including NASA's NEMO program. So I'm really excited to get to be a part of that. Uh, given the extreme environment of being at depth and increased pressure, right, Aquarius provides an excellent opportunity for uh, an analog for space uh, exploration. The mission is going to consist of a crew of six living aboard Aquarius at a depth of roughly 60 feet, and it's going to last a total of four days. So it is a shorter analog, but nonetheless, we're going to have uh, just as equally as exciting uh, studies to be done while we're underwater. Um, some of those studies include psychological and human factors uh, studies, uh, DNA and RNA sequencing for future astronaut missions, um, gut microbiome, uh, uh, um, sorry, testing for their gut microbiome changes uh, during a short analog, and then even EEG and brainwave patterning uh, are all going to be part of our mission. So. Overall, I'm really excited about it. I think ARG is a, uh, an excellent program and I'm exceedingly grateful to be a part of it and for all the mentorship and support that the program provides me. Uh, Dr. Miller, Scott Van Hoy, all of the staff and everybody, everyone has just been great, uh, profoundly welcoming, and I can't wait to participate in more missions. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Thank you so much, James. Thank you. That was a great overview. We're really excited to have you. Really excited to have you come on as our safety officer, and um, you know you're doing great things with that, and and very excited for Aquarius. And I'm glad that you mentioned it because going on with our slide deck, my next thing was to tell you guys about our upcoming missions that we are very very excited about. So, ARG has started out from doing you know one mission and being excited that no one died to. Um, <laughs> to a full-fledged research program um, where we have, uh, we've established a partnership with uh, University of North Dakota who own and operate the Inflatable Lunar Mars Analog Habitat or ILMA that we've re, um, referenced a little bit earlier in the presentation. And so we have a, uh, a working relationship with them where they are giving us a standard uh, two missions per year, one in the spring and one in the fall. Uh, so that is our, uh, these are these are past missions actually on here. I'm sorry. This is um, our spring mission uh, in 2022. May of 2022 was ARG 2I. So ARG is us, and then 2I because it was the second mission at ILMA, um, and ARG 3I, which just completed here in the fall, um, in September and October of this year, uh, and we have a a fourth mission, ARG 4I 
plan that we're in the process of planning for that will be in spring 2023 currently. Uh, so these were three pretty exciting missions. Um, ARG 2I is, uh, was for APUS um, graduate students. I have here some of the highlights from that mission, some of the research that they did, um, the live EBA events, which were pretty amazing and, and um, really exciting. You can find those on our YouTube channel. Um, they're recorded and this is a picture of the team uh, and some of their research. ARG3I that just completed this was a fantastic mission. These guys did so great. Um, they were, uh, we had a mix of graduate and undergraduate students, which was pretty cool. Uh, and uh, you can see a list of some of the different research projects that they did on that mission. And um, ARG4I, um, this is mentioning, uh, we're, we're it's a little bit of an old slide. We're, we're pretty much wrapped up with recruiting for it, but um, we are partnering. Uh, we have a group project for ARG4A that we're pretty excited about. We have a partnership with a company called Persistent Systems, who supplies um, <clears throat> uh, communications, field communications equipment to uh, you know firefighting and military applications and others. And they have agreed to give us some of their equipment to loan us some of their equipment to test during this mission because we think it has great application in space. So we're very excited for that. Our other mission that we're extremely excited about, so ILMA is our kind of our regular, um, regularly scheduled two a year missions. And then uh, we're trying to do once a year a special mission to, they're all special. We're trying to do a mission to a different habitat that's a little bit higher risk than than um, ILMA to get that risk factor in. So for this year, uh, in starting in January of 2023, our um, third mission will be to, third yearly mission will be to the MDRS facility. This is run by the Mars Society. Um, it's the Mars Desert Research Station. It's located in our uh, near Hanksville, Utah. So you can see from the picture here, one thing that's cool about it is the terrain, which looks pretty Mars-like apart from the blue sky. And uh, it, we've got a crew of seven space studies students, many of whom you'll hear from today, who will be going, and this is a, a couple of interesting things they'll be doing there. One thing that's going to be unique about this mission, the Mars Research Society, the Mars Society and MDRS has a uh, project that they're doing for this coming year where they are filming the different crews they're going to the last two days of the mission they're going to give them a challenge that they won't be expecting and they're going to film how the team problem solves and resolves and hopefully conquers that um, competition we're confident our team will and uh, that will be televised they're going to actually evaluate the teams compared to each other and choose the best teams who will get to be on the show and get a chance to win some prizes. So pretty cool. We're excited to be part of that initiative. Um, <clears throat> our, um, our third mission for the following year for 2024 is the Aquarius Reef Base mission that James mentioned. Uh, we're very excited. It's a much higher risk environment than we've ever worked in before and just a, a really amazing facility. So we're super excited for that. Um, so that just gives you a little bit of a flavor of some of the things we have coming up. And um, at this point, we're going to get to hear from some of our analog astronauts. And I, I will mention that several of them um, on this list, um, Sarah Guthrie, Terry Trevino, and Tyler Hines all um, have played both planning and um, analog astronaut roles in our program. So um, they'll probably tell you a little bit about both of those. Um, <clears throat> but we're excited to have um, our analog astronauts. And we're going to hear first from Sarah um, and then from Terry that I I think Terry's joining us actually live from the floor of a conference that he's at, so we're glad he's here. Um, I'm glad he made it. Hey, Hunter. Uh, we'll hear from Tyler and then Noah. Um, I don't think Lex has been able to make it quite yet. I know this is a bad time for him, so we'll go next to um, Nick, Selena, and we'll um, conclude with Keith. So we'll go in that order, and I'm going to stop screen sharing and turn it over to Sarah. Hi, hello, good morning. Um, thank you for that introduction. I'm going to try and screen share. Let's see how it's going to work. All right, can everybody see my slide? No? Am I muted? Seems to be loading, but it says you started screen sharing. There we go. Now we okay, can Okay, is it there now? Okay, so you see the, the analog 
splash page. Okay, cool. Hi. Um, so hello again. Um, you may remember I was at the Research Fest 21 last year um, for MDRS. Um, I am one of the analog astronauts um, for AARG. Um, I've been a mission specialist on two missions. I've been a flight director. Um, I'm also a mission commander for the Mars mission. And in addition to, to those responsibilities, um, I also have the privilege of being the recruitment coordinator as well. So I just wanted to take a moment just to share a few fun pictures and slides. I did tell Dr. Miller I was gonna make this all about me. So um, there's gonna be a great shot of me here in a second if I can get it to work. All right, so like I said, that's me. Um, I am a graduate student um, for the Space Studies program with the Astronomy Concentration. And I've been with ARG for almost two years now. And um, I'm incredibly grateful for the experiences that ARG has been given me. Um, I've been able to uh, do something I've always wanted to do since I was a child, and that's be an astronaut. Um, I've had a pretty unorthodox background. I joined the military when I was 17. Um, I'm about to retire here next year, and I've been deployed and had various career fields. And ARG gave me the opportunity to um, kind of live out that dream of being in the space field being an astronaut, but taking all that technical and military experience from, from combat to aircraft to uh, just a, a enthusiasm for space and, and put that towards um, hopefully enhancing human spaceflight. So um, like Dr. Miller said, each student has to come up with a research project. So my research project idea was um, if we had to rescue someone on the moon, how would we do it? And so it turns out there's quite a bit of literature um, with that same question mark over the years from Apollo to now Artemis um, and very little testing on it. Um, so with that, we decided that let's turn this into a research project. And so we came up with this very fancy long title called Evaluating Contingency EVAs and Rescue Techniques for Planetary Service Missions. So here um, I've got a few snapshots and a few videos um, of us performing those EVAs. Hopefully they're working and you guys can see them. And uh, these are my crewmates from ARG to I, um, Keith, Lex, and Terry out there pulling Kurt, and Kurt is our kinetic utilization research tool. Um, he happens to be our grappling dummy that we filled up with kitty litter and stuff and fluff and put a spacesuit on him so we could throw him around and do some testing and some rescues um, and not have to use a human participant. Um, I do wanna highlight at the bottom screen here, you'll see Terry attempting to put Kurt in a wheelchair and it was unsuccessful. And so um, I'd like to say all data is good data. So even though we had a bad test with the wheelchair, that um, gave me the opportunity to test this again um, with ARG3i. Um, did it switch? It didn't switch for me. Go. Oh no, I think I'm stuck. Um, is it not moving? My slide won't change. We're still on the same slide. Um, the videos are I working. think it's the videos. Yeah, maybe <laughs> pop out and reshare on the next slide. I can't. I can't. My mouse won't do anything. There we go. All right. Did that work? Is it done? Did yeah, it stop? It's done. It's done. Okay. I can't get move. Okay. I will work on that. But what we did was we introduced a harness um, to that. And so um, in doing that, this is really disappointing. I'm sorry. Um, Sarah, I've got them. Do you want me to share your slides? Sure, if you're able to. I can't get my screen to respond now. I'll pull them up. You go ahead. And... Um, so we introduced a different type of harness. One of the things that we discovered was is it's very hard to pick up someone when you're in that very large um, spacesuit that's given to us by UND. It's very bulky, of limited mobility, limited range of motion. The gloves are cumbersome. The whole suit's cumbersome. Um, and then you're trying to pick someone up. And so we introduced kind of like this external harness that had very large hooks on it. So we could pick Kurt up and we actually made him a lot heavier. We tried to make him comparable to lunar weight. Um, if he was about 185 pound individual with a 300 pound spacesuit on him. So he has a little over 82 pounds of stuff and fluff and litter inside of him. So we packed him pretty tight. As you can see, that's Kurt at the bottom of the screen. Um, <laughs> poor Kurt, he's been through a lot. Um, and so here's a, just a couple of snapshots from our last mission of, of, you know, again, understanding suit interface. So what we wanted to do is the sled was the thing that performed the best in the last mission. And so we wanted to continue to test the sled with Kurt, but try and look at different techniques for carrying and lifting. So if we had to pull the person off of the surface and place them in the sled and then take off with the sled. So that's kind of what it, we focused on for part two. 
Um, next slide. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, I am part of the MDRS mission. It's coming soon, so no spoilers, but I wanted to give you guys a good flash slide of a lot of uh, fancy pictures, if you mind clicking to the next one, ma'am. All right, so this is just a snapshot of all the things that we've you know, done, not even all the things, it's probably 10% of the things we've been able to do. But I wanted to highlight all of my other crewmates and our team members here. Um, as uh, somebody put a generous plug for our YouTube channel, that was something that we created in ARG2i and we were able to upload a lot of great videos on the research we were doing, what it's like to live in the habitat. We've done a podcast. We did several live EVA events, which I thought were really great, where people were able to call in, watch us perform a research study from not only from the perspective of inside of the helmet, but outside of the spacesuit while we did rescues and asked questions. Um, so that's just a poster there in the right-hand corner of that. Um, lots of our crewmates here, we did a youth outreach um, event on our last mission where our middle school came to see us. And so there's Lex and me in the spacesuits posing with them. Um, Cody is not here, but I wanted to highlight that he has a really cool research project about using um, human manure uh, and trying to grow um, vegetables in, uh, um, Mars Rigolith. And then, um, so I just wanted to put that splash slide up there. I don't want to give any spoilers again, because there's other crewmates are going to talk about their research projects, but I wanted to highlight all of their beautiful faces and all the wonderful talents that they have and all of the studies that they've been doing. So um, I will hand it off to the next person. Thank you, Dr. Miller, for fixing the slides for me. Oh, thank you so much, Sarah. That was fabulous. And I love this slide, I have to say. <laughs> That's my favorite slide ever. All right. Um, I think, uh, Terry, if you're here, you're next. Can you join? I am here. Can, can you hear me? Hello, everybody. From I don't have any slides. I was going to just take a couple minutes because I know Sarah had some really good um, information for everyone about our program. Uh, we are quite proud of it. Let's be honest. And I'm at, uh, I'm in Vegas, so everything's going to stay here. But I, uh, I'm here for the AIAA conference, which is fantastic. It's, um, it's brilliant to meet all of the industry players here in the space sector, particularly. Uh, I was here particularly to present a, a device that I'm, I built um, much about what we, we study in our space studies groups uh, and, and a lot of our research groups are, you know, what are the fundamental forces? How does space work? How does it all, you know, fit together with us and the analog groups? And uh, one of the things that came out of all of the analog missions, two analog missions that I've been, I've been in that tin can for 25 days at the uh, University of North Dakota not complaining it was wonderful brilliant experience but one of the things that uh, i i can say unequivocally is that having the time to do your research of clear mind without the uh, you know the distractions of everyday life was spectacular in my research particularly i'm i'm uh, uh, i'm really focused on uh, algae and i really like the astro astrobiology environment so i'm thinking how can we use algae as a source of nutrition? How can we use it as perhaps a source of fuel? Uh, it's certainly uh, uh, really great at uh, eating radiation as it tries to come through it. If it's in a medium and up against the wall, it has uh, quite a few uses up there. Down here, it has more uses. Dr. Miller and I are working on, on that. Um, I've also used it as maybe a, a perhaps you, uh, putting it out on the surface of Mars, you know, putting a big tent over it, pressurizing the tent, let's say, let's not call it a tent, let's call it a plant module, and, uh, and seeing if we can't remediate the, uh, the soil there on Mars. Uh, it has quite a bit of nutrition locked into it in, in many ways, so we might be able to use that. Uh, I, for me, our being one of the uh, beginning members, I wouldn't say co-founder because Scott really came to to AIAA for the uh, for the opportunity and, and uh, made the offer to do this at an AIAA meeting that we had uh, in 2020, I believe. And uh, thankfully he did because uh, it really propelled me into where I'm at now. I'm here representing AMU, uh, which is where I've graduated from. I'm a graduate student uh, working on my second master's now uh, in astronomy, my first uh, 
program was uh, aerospace science. And uh, yeah, I can't think of anything else other than to add um, that not just about joining AR AARG, but uh, you know, being a, a lifelong learner, being you know, approaching 60 years old, I have to say it's been a pretty significant life change for me. And if you need real estate in San Francisco, give me a shout. I can still help you. Anyway, that's it, Dr. Miller. I'll, I'll leave it alone. Thank you so much, Terry. Thanks for making time during the conference. We appreciate it. Um, Tyler, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. All right. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Um, I'll keep mine really brief. I, uh, like Terry, I did not have any pictures or slides to show, but I'll just give a brief background of my uh, piece to this whole puzzle. Um, so I started out with uh, being the deputy flight director um, on our 2 i um, still as an undergraduate student, I'm, you know, much, much early on as many other people, uh, you'll hear graduate student a lot, but I got started rather early in the program. Um, from that, I moved right into our 3 i and uh, that was with the actual mission director. Um, all these missions are incredible, uh, given the opportunity to be in the operations side of everything. Um, and a little bit like what Tony had said, you know, given that opportunity to be involved in something you never really worked for and something you would picture yourself in, either in the operational standpoint or anything, uh, it really does shift your perspective on exactly how you can get involved and what opportunities are out there for you. Um, that really did help me a lot in that area. I'm, I'm more than honored to be part of this program and to see how it's blossomed over the last year and a half. Um, and then for the upcoming mission for ARC 4I, um, I'll have the opportunity to be the chief of staff. So that was a newer role that they put in as the program has expanded. Uh, so I'm very happy about that and to kind of see how that pans out as well. Uh, and I'll also be shifting over as an analog astronaut for the uh, MDRS mission. I'm really excited about that. Um, it was kind of odd how that was put in. Uh, many shifts and changes had happened and I actually got to replace somebody, unfortunately, but fortunate for my case, I guess, um, and was put in for a uh, green hab officer. So I'll be making sure the plants don't die basically, uh, but I'll be doing my own side work. Um, even though I'm not at all working with plants or botanist in any way, um, I found not only all the work that we're doing on the side with the, the other missions, I decided to kind of make that my own um, and work on a plant studies experiments with a uh, Mars uh, simulator regolith and have flown seeds uh, try to sprout in them over the 14 day period that we're out there. So I'm really excited to see how that will pan out as well. Um, and really, if I could say to anybody in you know, getting involved in this, uh, it really is a phenomenal program. I could not say anything more amazing about it really. Um, it has helped tremendously uh, to develop everybody professionally, uh, even if they already are on a different path. Um, it does provide you the opportunity to get involved. And that's the best thing that any of us can hope for and to get that chance to really make an impact in something for the university. So it's an amazing opportunity for anybody and I would not recommend it enough. It's great. Thank you so much, Tyler, it was perfect. Um, let's see, uh, Noah, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Um, hello everyone, I'm Noah Loy. So I just got started here with AARG and I've just completed our ARG 3I mission there at Elma. So I've only done one um, where I was a mission specialist. I have another mission upcoming for the MDRS one, which I'll be on crew with a lot of these wonderful people as well. Um, I'm a current aerospace science space studies um, major with AMU. I'm a double major, also a civil engineering side at CU Denver. Um, I'm currently also active duty like a lot of our members are. So I'm on the Space Force side of things where um, I do a bunch of different things for the Space Force, um, space analysis, space operations, um, support some NASA Artemis through our bioastronautics office um, logistically. So some really cool things going on there. I was really excited to bring what I know to the table um, out to ILMA through AARG. Um, I studied electrolysis there and at MDRS, I'm going to actually be supporting our astronomer Selena with some astronomy, which I'm super excited for. Um, electrolysis, if you guys don't know, water electrolysis is essentially uh, one, running an electric current through water, separating those uh, molecular bonds to isolate oxygen and hydrogen. And we got a lot of clean data through a lot of different solutions, um, running different electric currents through different conductors. 
um, and yielded some incredible results. I'm excited to keep that study going. But um, the whole point of how that was possible was uh, going through uh, AMUs, APUSs, AARG, um, which really came together with a lot of phenomenal folks from different sides of uh uh, different expertise that all came together to kind of make a mission a reality and make research a reality for a lot of different uh, universities, institutions, um, public and private sectors, uh, all working together. So it, it's really exciting to be a part of this. It's it's exciting to work with all of you. Um, everyone's so welcoming. And, and if you're not an analog astronaut, everyone's so supportive and helpful with the research, with the communications, um, keeping this program alive as it just kind of speeds up and accelerates and expands from here. I only joined earlier this year, and, and since I've ex uh, joined, it's just it's sped up and and grown so much. So I'm excited to see uh, where it goes and how further I can support it. So thank you, Dr. Miller. Thank you so much, Noah. We appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> we have a couple members of our team, uh, Nick and Selena, who weren't um, <clears throat> able to be here because of the time and and work commitments, but they have shared with me some videos that they created to tell you guys a little bit about their experience. So I'm gonna go ahead and do those at this point. Um, okay, hopefully you guys can see my screen. And this is Nick Pender, who's one of our uh, analog astronauts for the upcoming um, MDRS mission. Hi, my name is Nicholas Pender. I'm a space studies graduate student here at AMU, and today I just want to speak with you all about my experiences in the AARG group and our upcoming mission to the Mars as a research station. Um, first and foremost, I just want to give a big thank you to the leadership at AMU and APUS in your support for our missions. Um, we could not make these missions happen without your support. It is greatly appreciated. Um, so just a big, big thank you um, in, in your support for these missions. Thank you. Um, now, how I got into this group, uh, I joined back in early 2021 uh, when I saw an advertisement recruiting astronauts for a Mars as a research station mission. Uh, at the time, it, it sounded really cool. Um, it, it looked like an opportunity to make a difference, and boy, was that ever true. Um, so. This, this community in AARG and the AIAA club in general has been awesome. Just being surrounded by like-minded individuals, I didn't expect to get this kind of experience at an online university. So yeah, huge kudos to this to this organization for all that they make happen um, in, in enriching this online uh, university experience. Um, for our mission coming up to the Mars as a research station, I am the health and safety officer for the mission. So that's going to be my one of my focuses on this mission is, is on those aspects. I'm going to be trained in CPR, uh, in the use of AEDs, and then just ensuring the health and safety aspects of the mission are being accounted for. Um, my focus for my research on this mission is the use of supply caches, and that is to extend the human exploration of Mars. Um, we need to have resources reliably nearby um, in order to survive and re get to those hard to reach places for science objectives. And so taking a logistics lens to this Mars as a research station mission, we want to look at uh, placing down supply caches to in strategic locations to extend that human exploration and survivability in the harsh Martian environment. So we are going to take one of these supply caches out to the Mars as a research station and test in utilizing them um, and, and putting them through the rigors of, of, a, of a mission on Mars. So um, that, that's my mission. Uh, thank you very much. Awesome. And, um, and our next presenter is Selena Pena who is uh, one of our, also one of our analog astronauts for the Mars mission. Good morning, my name is Selena Pena and I am an APUS student in the Master's Space Studies program. I am sorry I could not attend the research fest today. I am currently teaching 48 eighth graders about fossils. 
Although the topic is fascinating, it is less exciting than the research I'll be conducting with my colleague Noah Loy on our MDRS mission at the end of January 2023. We have two focuses of research plan during our mission. Um, the first is based on solar activity. Our second focus is on HAZ variable star V0799 located in the Auriga constellation. To conduct our research, we will have the privilege of operating two telescopes. The first is a Lunt uh, 100 millimeter refracting telescope in the Musk Observatory. And the second we will use remotely, and that's a large 14 inch Celestron Edge HD Schmidt Cassegrain reflector telescope. I feel honored to be chosen for this particular mission to utilize the resources, especially two observatories at the MDRS uh, location in Utah. The task is an excellent opportunity to learn about something phenomenal and implement our skills more in the field. Again, thank you for the opportunity and you do not know how grateful I am to be part of something so exhilarating. Thank you. I'm so glad that I appreciate them sending in the slides, uh, the videos, so that we could hear from them today, even when it didn't work for their schedule. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again because, uh, Keith, we'd love to hear from you next. And I think I have a couple of slides for you. So um, let me pull these up. Here we go. Oops. Okay. I'm gonna, I'll let you take it away, Keith. Unmuted. Okay. Hello. Uh, my name is Keith Pierce. I am a master's student at uh, at uh, AMU in space studies, and uh, I was a, an analog astronaut on uh, ILMA two or ARG two I, and then um, also had a research project on ARG three um, I. So. Um, you know, we've talked about how like the, there's the advantage of doing um, analog astronaut studies is to kind of uh, identify issues that we have, you know, or that could potentially arise before they become an issue, you know, on another planet and so or a celestial body. And uh, it became apparent pretty quickly that um, there were some major issues with the suit and load distribution and kind of fit and and a whole host of issues. And um, so it seemed worthwhile to kind of pull on that thread and uh, see if we could kind of come up with some scenarios and some and some solutions to, to the issues that we were having with the suit sizing. So um, what, uh, what we decided to do was uh, during 2i was just kind of go real quick, grab a, uh, an off the shelf hiking harness and some hiking sticks and uh, or trekking poles and see if we could and see if we could um, configure the harness in a, in a couple different ways to uh, you know in, improve the the fit of the harness, the low distribution of the harness, and uh, kind of reduce the overall uh, you know um, demand on the on the harness operator. Um, during Ilma 2i, we we saw some promising results in the initial testing. And uh, it, it looked like it was something worth, worth continuing into 3i. So for 3i, we, we, we did a little bit more deliberate approach. Um, we, we kind of, uh, we built a harness that was more specific to the EVA suit. Um, you can kind of see some photos of that. Uh, we used some, just some hardware from, from, uh, from Lowe's, hooked it to a hiking pack um, and came up with an interface with the suit. Uh, we also, developed some uh, two different routes that we were going to use for our mobility for our mobility study. Um, you can see there route A, route B, um, just to kind of standardize uh, what we we're going to do. And then we also um, uh, we just developed some scenarios and some and some areas that we were going to that we were going to measure. Um, so next slide. And so what we did is we we looked at is there another slide too? just so I know if it's there. Uh, there should be a. There's well, one more. Is, there's one anyway, more. This is, last graph. 
Uh, okay. Um, there's a line graph after this. Okay, cool. So, so we looked at it. So we, we took a bunch of scenarios. Um, we, we went through them with the space suit. Uh, we, we looked at just the suit as it was designed. We looked at the suit with a, with a, with a, uh, with the hiking pack internal to the suit. And, uh, we also looked at the suit with trekking poles and then we kind of rolled it all together, took the trekking poles and the, and the harness. And we kind of, uh, got a bunch of data and we, and we got data, uh, we, we got some qualitative data. We got some quantitative data for quantitative data. We just kind of looked at really just the heart rate is, is uh, was the biggest thing we looked at uh, just to kind of measure the amount of exertion uh, that, that the analog astronaut was doing from, from uh, one scenario to the other. Then we also looked at some qualitative data um, things like areas of, uh, of discomfort or um, uh, how they, how they felt the exertion compared um, from one scenario to another. And then if we go to the line graph, um, this line graph is just kind of, this is just an aggregate of all the different astro astronauts heart rates over all the different scenarios. Um, one thing to note was despite have, taking a more deliberate approach in, in this particular study, um, we did still have some, just some factors that were out of our control. Some, some things we didn't expect, like, um, some of the, you know, the, the size of the astronauts, uh, kind of, kind of affected the, the fit of the suit more than we expected in some, in some, uh, scenarios we had like, you know, battery issues, it, different things that, um, we, we would like to troubleshoot in future, in future studies. But, um, that's just kind of like an overview. Um, I, I think, I think that this, this research project is uh, super interesting, but it also kind of outlines how like, the analog astronaut program can, can, um, identify an issue, um, you know, in an, in, 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 um, you know, in the analog environment. Um, and then you can kind of start to, to develop some testing, some scenarios, and you can kind of run almost like iterations on how to, on how to solve that problem. Um, and so, uh, that's pretty much an overview of, um, this project and, uh, and uh, how kind of where we're at with it. Thank you so much, Keith. Really exciting stuff you've been doing. Um, I just want to throw this slide up here really quickly. Um, I won't leave it up very long, but we have um, lots of social media sites. If you want to learn more about the program or see our YouTube videos, and uh, and we can make that available to anyone interested. And um, and with that, we'll pause. I think we're almost at time, but we're happy to answer any questions if we have time for them. Um, so I'll let you. Let me know, Kelsey. I haven't been monitoring the chat. I don't know if there's questions in there or if anyone wants to ask anything. Just lots of wows and amazing. <laughs> and I can say, you know, it is such a privilege for us to be able to host all of you today and for our faculty to get to know your projects a little better. It's a great reminder of the really amazing things that we can get done and sort of reshaping this distance education experience, right? So I just wanna say thank you to everybody who's here and who's shared your projects. I'm really excited to, to see what's next. And I wanna thank all of the students who were here. I know that's um, difficult to, to fit this presentation into your day and I really appreciate all of you guys for all you do in Oregon for being here today. You guys did a fantastic job with each of your presentations. Thank you. Huh. We do have a minute or two if anybody has questions, but just getting a lot of so exciting, <laughs> so impressive. And Tony's right. Tony put in the chat that we are still recruiting a little bit for next spring. So if anyone is interested, um, you know, let your students know <laughs> if you think they would be interested and, and contact me if you, uh, you know, want some of our recruitment materials that, um, we would be happy to recruit and from as wide a net as we possibly can in the university. And thanks to Terry for giving us a sneak peek of the conference that he's at today. <laughs> All right, well, I'm just gonna drop a quick link in here for the research for the public good schedule. We have another presentation at 1 p.m. today and another one at four. Um, but with that, again, thank you immensely for, for being here. Very, very excited to see 
what's next for you all and to hear about the upcoming missions. So. Thank you so much. Thanks for the time to present today. We appreciate it. And thank you, especially um, to the research grad office and Kelsey and all of your team for um, all of the support you give to ARC. We really appreciate that. So, all right. Thank you all for coming.